folks, this is the million dollar question. Why wasn't Texas prepared for last week's deadly winter storm? Tomorrow morning, we will get that answer perhaps directly from energy officials and the folks that run ERCOT. Today, we learned the Texas power grid was four minutes and 37 seconds away from a catastrophic collapse. If that had happened, it would have taken weeks, perhaps months to get the state out of the dark. So at the high point of last week's outages, more than 48% of ERCOT's power generating capacity was offline. That left more than 4 million households without power. Tonight, Governor Abbott calling it absolutely unacceptable in that rare televised address. He says the system broke and as you heard, you deserve answers. We now know that power generators of all sources were not prepared for this severe winter weather. We have also learned that ERCOT operators should have acted quicker to stabilize the grid and to prevent power generators from being knocked offline. Well, the governor wants to mandate the winterization of Texas power sources. Experts agree that would have prevented a great deal of the grid failure. ERCOT addressed the failures during a meeting today. We had to limit electric supply because you cannot provide more demand. You can't serve more demand than you have supply and you've got to keep that system in balance. Well, ERCOT's emergency meeting today was the start of the fallout. Leaders will be testifying tomorrow during several hearings in front of Texas lawmakers. And the agency will be looking for new leadership. These five ERCOT members who live out of the state resigned yesterday. A six joined the group and resigned today. Tonight, Bowman ISD students remain in virtual classrooms working from home as the district scrambles to make repairs and clean up after last week's wicked winter storm. It is a mess. And tonight, for the first time, we are getting a closer look at some of the damage at 24 campuses. Now, 12 News reporter Jordan James joins us live with an update on the cleanup and restoration efforts. Yeah, Dejanique, damage is so out, damage is so widespread across Beaumont ISD that Beaumont's ISD superintendent said she didn't have any other options than to allow time for cleanup. Behind the chained up fences of several Beaumont ISD campuses is a lot of work being done. Unfortunately, uh, the type of storm that this was, you know, it, it impacted us greatly. Picture after picture illustrating the impact that the winter storm had on campuses, leaving behind several busted pipes and widespread damage that Superintendent Shannon Allen hasn't seen since Imelda. So many facilities that didn't have heat, that didn't have uh, or had issues with the chiller or broken or busted pipes. And of course, we didn't have water. You know, we couldn't flush toilets. We couldn't serve and feed our students because of the boil water notice. 15 campuses and nine district facilities sustained damage, forcing Allen to make what she believes was the right decision to cancel in-person classes through the week. It's always a concern when we don't have our students face to face. But I'm, I am thankful that we have the option and opportunity to switch to virtual learning so that learning could still occur. Now, however, I can't wait until we can get our students back. Since Monday, crews have been able to fix most of the repairs with the exception of a few campuses. Despite the damage, Allen is confident in their plans moving forward. We went rides, we wrapped pipes, you know, we lowered chillers, we went through our checklist of things to try to prepare uh, for this event. So we will continue to enhance those uh, processes. And, you know, I'd hate to see what would have happened if we would not have been able to do that. Dr. Allen expects most of the repairs to be done by this weekend, with the exception of Beaumont United. So most students should return to campuses on Monday. Reporting here live in Beaumont, Jordan James, 12 News. Help is on the way. That is the message tonight from plumbers and contractors who are headed to Texas to help us with storm repairs. But how do you make sure you hire someone who's reputable? It starts with doing some homework and thorough research about them and their company. Look out for someone who offers to give you a low price because they have leftover materials. Also check for references and keep receipts. Something else to consider if they're only requesting cash as payment and price gouging. They may just look at your project and say, yes, all that's going to cost $10,000 when they haven't actually stepped up and looked at it and itemized it at all. Even if you think you found the contractor you want, get at least two other bids. Yeah, and make sure everything is spelled out in the contract. Your insurance adjuster could help figure out if the cost is fair. The sheriff's office also recommends using local contractors and paying with credit cards because they offer additional protection. 
Now, mud bug lovers, the storm also caused some issues for crawfish season. Cold weather early in the season can sometimes cause the crawfish to stop moving and going after bait. Now, farmers are working hard to make up ground. And the sun and the warmer temperatures should help a bit. It's early in the year, but uh, it, your catch can, can double over, overnight, you know. With this sun coming out and stuff, you can, you can go from catching 50 pounds to 100 real, real quick. Broussard says he was still getting calls last week during the freezing weather and he expects the demand for crawfish to go way up around Easter. Some of you will be waking up to dense fog in the morning. This is our roofing 911 sky cam in orange at the Horseman showing the fog creeping in there, certainly slowing down traffic along Interstate 10. Chief Meteorologist Patrick Vaughn in the Storm Tracker Center tonight. Uh, Patrick, what other areas are being affected? Well, mainly in the triangle at this time uh, along Interstate 10, but that is going to be creeping northward. So uh, let's take a look at the time lapse and you can see how uh, as this uh, dense fog developed over in Port Arthur, how visibilities went down. And this is sea fog. What's happened is that the coastal waters have cooled down. Very chilly water, uh, 52 degree water temperatures just offshore. And so when you have a south wind coming out of the Gulf of Mexico from maybe deep south uh, Gulf of Mexico that's laden with moisture, that moisture is cooled to saturation. It forms a low level cloud and that's what we are seeing. Uh, as this dense sea fog has developed, mainly affecting the triangles. Visibilities are greatly below one mile. And uh, the dense fog advisory for Jefferson, Orange, and Chambers County until 10 a.m. Wow, you can't even see out the door over at LaBerge Casino Resort. It's all fog, and that's what we expect in the morning. More on your forecast coming up on 12 News. There's progress to report tonight as Southeast Texas mass vaccination clinics speed things up. They had to play catch up after the winter storm. Clinics in Jefferson County have now given out a combined 8,000 doses. Health departments have an option to speed things up if the region requests help. The county could request military personnel to help administer the shots. Now, some places like Port Arthur had major water issues after the storm, and the city's health director tells us they're eyeing the option. Our emergency management did reach out to us and ask us if that's something that we could, you know, could use and of course we're not going to um, turn away help so I'm, I'm just not sure I know that it's stated that if there is a need. Judith Smith said their mass vaccination hub is managing pretty well. They're seeing anywhere from 400 to 600 people a day. Some new info tonight at 10. There's a new CDC study that finds teachers may be the biggest COVID-19 spreaders in school, certainly more so than students. Yeah, a lot of Texas teachers consider it further proof why they should have immediate access to these vaccines. Jason Miles has a closer look. Nearly a year after catching COVID. It was the week after we got back from spring break is when I started feeling bad. Houston ISD teacher Renette Brown remains thankful she's been able to return to work because at one point she wasn't so sure. And I really thought that this was it. I had been watching the news and every time I looked around someone uh, who was overweight, who was a black, female, diabetic, high blood pressure, was dying. And I was like, that's me. Brown still doesn't know where she may have contracted COVID, but always thought students posed a potential risk at school. However, according to a new CDC study, teachers may cause more cases. Nine COVID clusters were examined at a school district in Georgia, and only one of the nine was a student clearly the first documented case. The other eight involved probable teacher-to-student transmission. Texas is one of the states that decided not to put teachers in phases 1A or 1B of vaccine distribution, something for which many educators have argued over the past few months. The Texas American Federation of Teachers and others consider the new study further evidence that all teachers should be among the first with access to COVID vaccines. I think teachers should be on the front line to go ahead and receive uh, the, the vaccine if they uh, so, do so decide to uh, take it. Meanwhile, Brown believes cleaning and other protocols, including limited in-person meetings among teachers, greatly mitigate the risk, no matter what a study might say. 
All right, let's turn to the numbers tonight. Area health departments are still getting back in their routines after the winter storm and data about new cases is somewhat sporadic. I want to share what we do have tonight. 133 new cases for our region. I draw your attention to 48 that came out of Orange County. Also 46 cases coming out of Liberty County and Orange County today confirmed nine additional deaths, but these did not all occur today. We turn to hospitalizations now and they continue declining. This graph goes all the way back to the start of the pandemic. We've highlighted that 15% metric here because that is what's allowed to keep the occupancies at businesses uh, at the new levels. And you can see we've been going down really uh, for the past two weeks or so uh, significantly. So that is good news for bars and those restaurants.